So I'm going to talk about uh, an organization called OASA, um, which is a regenerative eco-village builder based in Switzerland. And we've got our first project in Portugal called Traditional Dream Factory. Um, I'm going to go through a number of pieces around um, what makes up um, OASA. And there's a number of people that are here uh, across this weekend who have been to our first project in Portugal. So uh, as they may turn up at different points, there's something that they could add as well to the experience of what it's like uh, to be there on the ground and what we're doing. So first of all, I want to talk to you about um, the experience of being in our first project, Traditional Dream Factory. So it's a 30 hectare um, piece of land in a former chicken coop, uh, chicken factory, um, now no longer the case for a lot, quite a long time. Um, it has a five hectare piece of land that we have um, un, uh, owned and then a further option on a, a 30 hectare piece, so a larger piece. Um, OASA has the wider network, so the, it's based in Switzerland, it's a, a Swiss Verein as an association. This is the body that's looking to put 100,000 hectares into conservancy um, across the first 12 projects initially. Um, and being in our project day to day, so um, the experience of being there, I was there across most of June. Um, we set up last year, at the beginning of last year. Um, in hot days, people are working on the land uh, very early, so six o'clock, seven o'clock. People are up there growing, uh, planting trees all together. Um, then people make their way through to the central space. And so there's a courtyard space that I'll talk through a little bit and I can, I can show some pictures to people afterwards. Um, a courtyard space where people come together and they talk about what their intentions for the day is, uh, map out where their relation is in, in terms of joy and to, to previous days, but also to each other, and have a conversation about what it is for them to be there in that place at that point. They then work together for the morning in various different things, but two or three hours of work. Um, there's a cook on site, and so at lunchtime uh, we have beautiful food, mostly prepared from the land, uh, and increasingly so. Um, and so we have lunch together, and then in the afternoon you do whatever you want to do, so it's your own projects, and some people work on computers, some people take personal projects on the land. And then in the evenings we come together, and a number of people will cook, uh, there's a rotor for that. Um, and throughout the week, there's these patterns that build up that the experience of being there is, is fairly rhythmic. Closer. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, it's, it's fairly rhythmic in terms of like just the reliance on the land, the places in which people go to in different parts of their week. And uh, for me, going up in the mornings, up into certain spaces and, and looking out across this piece of land and connecting to the, the village that we are on the edge of. So if you look at the far um, image, we're in a, next to a small village, so right on the edge of a small village uh, called Abella. It's in the bottom third of, um, of Portugal, a uh, traditional dream factory. And the pieces of land, uh, if you get closer afterwards, there's one, two, three here on, on the top of the map. Um, the first is the chicken sheds themselves that have, um, have been, are being converted. The second is the piece of land that goes up the hill, uh, which is a further five hectares. And then number three is the um, 30 hectare site. And this is our first experimental project, a little bit smaller uh, than the other ones that will come later, we hope, uh, that uh, is aiming to experiment with a number of different things that the network wants to do. Um, most of that is these experimental methodologies around issuing uh, nature-backed assets. So these sovereign communities being able to issue them themselves in their own projects, and I'll go into that in a moment. Um, and we use a number of protocols to measure that, to verify it. So we've got some relationships in terms of being able to do that functionally with collaboration. Um, but the connection that I want to establish here is that we're a community land trust, and, and an important part of this is that Abella, the village, is a, a fundamental part of this first project and will be a fundamental part of later projects is this um, assumption that we're going to be working to make these villages and towns that we're next to uh, 
better, that we're going to be integrated and part of them uh, and offer something rather than being um, an alien entity that drops down and, and is its own thing and, and keeps up its own boundaries. And so there's been a lot of work over uh, the last year making sure that there's integration, ma making sure there's Portuguese speakers uh, on the ground, that there's a lot of work bringing people into this community and building bridges uh, with people. Um, and that is, I would say, a, a strong success at the moment in terms of the way that this village is, is taking on the people that are coming to this project. So that's the first thing. It's a community land trust. It's, it, ex it exists for the wider community, not just the people that live on this site. And that will continue to be the case going forwards. Um, OASA is the top level organization. So it's the land trust of land trusts where there'll be, this is the first project in Portugal. OASA will own a number of different um, projects. The land in, uh, in, in Portugal will be owned by OASA, the, the top level association. Uh, and so all the accounting, all of the different uh, elements around uh, the local treasuries that I'll go into in a moment, everything is done through this uh, direction, back into Switzerland, through these local bodies. And that's an important one because it allows us to um, fragment across a number of different jurisdictions across the world, but still have this Swiss base. So it allows the autonomy of projects like the Portuguese one or any others that join the network to be owned functionally underneath this Swiss association of which each of the projects uh, can, can have power over. So the governance is through delegation upwards to this organization. And this organization's single purpose is maintaining the regenerative land use principles. So that's a, a set of principles across soil, water, air, waste, biodiversity, energy and construction, and community, of which has a number of guidelines, so things that are expected, and a number of red lines, things that if you're contravening them, there will be some kind of enforcement downwards to the projects. And that's maintained by the projects, so that the updating and making sure that they're relevant is continues to be a conversation. But a secondary layer to that to that top OASA is the um, gu guardians uh, of the land. So these, pr these guardians are a number of experts from around the world in different areas, uh, representation from different areas as well, who make, make sure that these principles are being upheld alongside the, the organizations that are on the ground. Um, and we are, a, we are a set of DAOs. And so the, the, la the, the bottom scale, the Portuguese project will be the first, is the first DAO. These DAOs are advisory upwards to this, to this top body. And so the top body isn't itself a DAO, it's a Swiss association, but it's advisory from the DAOs. So any decision that they make, uh, it has to take on. It could contravene them through this guardian of council, these, these, this council uh, of guardians. Uh, but the idea is that it's advisory in that direction. And it's the issuer of our, of our tokens. And so the first token will be the TDF token, the traditional Dream Factory token issued by OASA. Um, OASA will then purchase shares in traditional Dream Factory uh, in return for some money, which is lending to the project at a very small interest rate because it has to uh, due to Swiss law. And all of this will happen towards the end of this year. So we've been preparing for this across uh, the last year. Uh, the land was bought earlier in 2021. So we're, we're doing this work at the moment of setting up the Swiss Association, which is in process, very expensive. So that's something I can comment on in the conversation part of this, in terms of setting up a Swiss Association, the legal fees and that kind of thing. Um, fortunately, our lawyer has taken 50% token payment. So that's <laughs> part of the, uh, the answer here, but it's still expensive compared to other land trusts that I've set up around the world. Yeah. Well, my experience, so across the last 10 years, I've been setting up community land trusts in England. So that's all my experience. And so branching out from that over the last two years is new for me. Setting up an equivalent system, uh, a legal structure in the UK is about 5,000 pounds, which is already quite expensive. Uh, we can set up organizations for, for 50 pounds very quickly that do a certain job, but something equivalent to this would be 5,000. Uh, to set up a WASA, it was about 30,000 euros. So quite significantly larger. And also a lot of this is uncharted terrain, even for lawyers that have been recommended through having done work with blockchains before. And so many of the approaches when we were building the articles, when we were creating this, the agreements for the token sales, the private agreements, the SAFTs, all of that was generated from scratch. And sometimes we were looking at the lawyer having created something which is a set of bullet points which is definitely not what I'm used to coming from a very 
uh, well-articulated sector in the UK with, with decades, if not hundreds of years worth of jurisprudence in this kind of area. So we're often working with model rules, finding that we were starting from blank pages a lot more, um, which is quite disconcerting when you're trying to create something that's, that's, that's fairly new. So it's taken four or five months to get to this point already. We've got very watertight uh, approaches now. We've got a really good set of articles. We've got good uh, token sale agreements. We've got a really good set of principles that sit against them. Uh, and the white paper is, is well developed, uh, has been developing for 18 months or so. Um, so I'll issue the tokens. We're part of, um, there's a number of layers to this, and so we can talk about them, but I've, I've talked about this, this, this two-layer um, entity so far, but we're part of a, a wider constellation of organizations that are, uh, are together and working to build power yeah, equally, you know, alongside each other. The first is Rebuild, which is a, a gathering of, of eco-village builders that have been meeting all over the world. First, first was last year, at the beginning of uh, last year, with an online conference and then a Portuguese conference in last September. And since then, there's been one in uh, Costa Rica, there's been one in the Netherlands, and then the current one in Portugal is happening right now, the gathering of tribes. Um, and so this came out of that as well. So it's connected, uh, very heavily connected. And then we've got an organization called Closer.Earth, and Closer is the, is the bookings platform for, for these kind of regenerative communities. So they're looking to use traditional Dream Factory as the first case. But they're also the ones that work on the tokenomics. And so although we're the clients, we're, we're specifying what it is that we want as OASA, Closer is the one building it. They're the ones with the developers. And they'll be building on, on Celo, the Celo blockchain, our token that's going to be initially TDF. And the innovation at this stage is that it's a single token. Uh, it represents both finance and governance, which is um, not always the case. There's sometimes multiple tokens that are going on, sets of stables, finance, governance, equity. There's a, a number of ways you can do it. But in TDF, we've got one token. Um, and when people stake that token, which is a representation of their equity that they buy to, to gain into the project, that's one day in the project. So one token is one day. It's equivalent to timeshare. And so if you buy a month worth of tokens, it's a perennial token which will allow you to get a month of staying in the project at any time that you want if there's availability on site. Every single year, if you buy six months, then you've got, they've got half of the year. If you buy the entire year, 365 tokens, each year you've got 100% usage of the site, which is not what we want. Um, and so we're looking for a distribution uh, actively. But that is the principle that sits here. It's perennial, keeps moving. And what Closer have been developing is something called Proof of Presence, which you can read about on our website. The idea, and it's a version one, and there's going to be a number of issues with it, but the idea that people who are closer to the project, who've been staking their tokens to stay, you have to stake, to to stake it in the contract to stay in the project, gain proof of their presence, and that increases their governance weighting. And so if you've been away for two or three years, but you still own uh, tokens, you still own equity in our project, you have a reduced... Uh, uh, power within your voting application. Now we can see there's going to be a number of issues with this, that people closer to the site are going to have more power. There's a number of benefits as well. So we're going to see this as version one, and that version two will have a number of extra things layered into it as well. But it's something that we're, we're testing. As I mentioned, uh, TDF is a, is a sort of playground for experimentation on a number of different things. And, and so uh, this is one of those. Um, the other one is the thing around being natural asset issuers. So the tokenization is, is our representation of regeneration on our schemes. We're using um, Open Forest Protocol. So we're in the test phase of Open Forest Protocol at the moment, who are a um, measurement, reporting, and verification uh, protocol. That allows us next year, when they open their carbon markets, to, um, to be able to measure our impact on this piece of land and to issue our token ag against it and to be able to show what, what we're doing to regenerate these pieces of land. Uh, across the number of principles that I mentioned before. Um, we are, I'll just talk about the land for a second then. The land was bought in 2021 and, and it was bought by a private individual. So this is an important part of us having the stability to work on this across the last year was we weren't looking to raise finance to then go and buy the land. Someone bought it originally, the first number one on that map just above Abella. We also own number two, but we're paying rent on that, that piece. So it gives us access to start planting. We've planted over a thousand trees in the last six months. 
we're growing that first 0.6 hectares across to, to a further one and a half that's being monitored by Open Forest. And then that'll allow us to have an option. The agreement we've got is an option to buy the further 25 hectares to complete the pieces of land purchase. When we do our token launch later this year, we were looking to raise 4 million euros. We've already raised 350,000 euros against private contracts on this, but we're not allowed to do that until we've got approval from the Swiss authorities, from FINMA, to do it publicly, but we've, we can raise privately. Um, what will happen at that point is that all of the people that have put in sweat equity, that have made soft loans, that have engaged with the project so far in a financial sense, um, will have their tokens is distributed to them in, re in, in recognition of the investments they've made that are currently being held on a private spreadsheet. So it's all done centrally at this stage while we're still working on different bits. But an important factor here is the ability to go and start working on this project, to be showing people around, to have people living there across stewardship cycles um, that we run throughout the year. Um, so it gives us some autonomy to get going, I would say. And so those are the two, the two layers. Um, and I'll just finish with talking about how the different patterns operate across the year. So we, we operate on um, equinox periods. So we run three-ish three month uh, stewardships where four or five people manage the property. Um, they separate into water management and tree management, um, animals on the land, although there's none at the moment, uh, the, the different buildings and maintenance, uh, people do coordination. Um, and so there's a number of stewards that sit on, that stay on the land and that they cycle through uh, across these periods. We're just about to have one this week, which is then followed by our retreat um, next weekend. And so that happens, um, this, we're just coming to the end of the summer equinox, coming into the winter, to the autumn, uh, and then winter. And so it's different groups cycling through all the time and having good amounts of handover uh, to be able to run this site effectively. Um, we have a number of conflict transformation um, policies in order to make sure that things are handled um, effectively, that well, the well-being of people that live there is, is paramount uh, to us as people managing this. And we are run as a wider organization, as the DAO for Traditional Dream Factory, using sociocracy. So we have a number of circles across this organization, from uh, the coordination circle at the top, which I'm part of, down through to delegates that sit on that, that come from the architecture circle that are working with our architects and doing the construction, through to our legal circle that's employing our lawyer and that will transform into governance uh, as we move through this year. We've also got um, the food circle uh, who are di distributing the growing and the, the permaculture plan and enacting that master plan across the, the, the next year. Um, we have a number of circles that represent different things and that they are the bodies of which have full autonomy, ideally at that local level, of which most of decisions are made at that scale. Very few decisions we want to happen on chain. We want the really big ones, the ones about our articles, the ones about really important changes that fundamentally affect different stakeholders in the project. But we want most of the decisions to happen day to day with the autonomy of these circles and little working groups within them. That being an important function because attention is fragile in these projects. And to call upon it requires you to coalesce everyone and inform everyone in, you know, adequately in order to make good decisions. And often you find in, in DAOs that we've been working in, it can operate like a 24-7 AGM, like constant decisions to be made by the, by the DAO that are enacted and then move forwards that can be a little bit overwhelming and can diminish the sort of quorum of people getting involved. And so we're trying to be really careful in scoping out what decisions are the ones that everybody needs to pay attention to within the wider DAO and what decisions can be made in order to follow through on a number of agreements that give them autonomy to just get on with the work that needs to be done so that there's that trust that moves between these layers and we've got strong communication going through the coordination of this larger circle. So there's good communication running through both the Discord and our weekly meetings uh, of the circles. That, I think, is a, a quick overview. I know there's a lot of parts, and I was pretty baffled when I first got involved as like, all the different bits, and so I'm really happy to answer some questions um, about anything that you might have. But we reckon that we're, um, if we manage to raise the four million at the end of this year, which we're quite confident about, we will be, the f we think, the first in Europe to raise for this kind of project, primarily through Web3 means uh, as a governance finance token. And so we're trialing some things that may have um, implications for other projects that are looking to do the same sort of thing. And we're very happy to both incorporate new people into the network, but also share what we've done um, so far. So um, 
hope that's uh, of use, and I'm happy to answer anything. Yeah, first of all, um, I spent some time at TDF in like this July. Okay. And yeah, it's a great place. It's like really, it has this like young spirit, you know, everything's like everything's open. We just started, like it's great people, great energy. I really recommend checking it out if you happen to go to Portugal. Um, having said that, I have actually two questions, if I may. Um, maybe the more easy one is, um, like what's the what's the vision for the area to be reforested like the ecological vision um because that wasn't entirely clear to me um right now i think it used to be a pasture it's like mostly planted with stone oaks i think um but yeah i wonder what it's going to be turned into <laughs> um the other question is so the utility of the tdf token um yeah, you explained that like one token equals one day to stay there. Um, I wonder what is required of people that like acquire this token and then stay there for one day. Like for example, compared to the model now where there's like basically volunteers and then there's guests, right? And guests will pay money, but there's like less of a duty or something or like less expected of like participating in work. What would be expected of token holders or like people that I guess pay with tokens or stake them? Yeah, sure. Um, so the first is, uh, what is the plan for the wider regeneration of all of the lands? The three pieces that I've got up there. Uh, and the second one was, what is the obligation of the token holders, aside from visitors and guests on the site? Um, so for the first one, uh, at the moment, when you were there, you'll have seen the first th over 1,000 trees now that have been planted already near the existing, um, the existing site, the buildings. Um, the aim for that is a, is a food forest across all of it. So to explain what the current um, landscape is, it's a classic Alentasia landscape as defined by the Portuguese government. So it's, it's um, core cokes with then very dry gra grassland. So it's quite sparse. There's, there's trees throughout, but it's not a dense tree, treescape with some quite old trees on it. Um, the, this is kept traditionally in this area because there's a government grant in order to encourage this. This is seen as, as, as a classic Alentasia landscape but it's very susceptible to fire. It is not, doesn't hold water in the land effectively. And so growing other things on this, this piece of land is, is tricky at this point. It's, it's rocky, hard soil. And so a lot of the work that's got to be done is through support we're getting from others across Portugal on centropic farming methods to create a food forest across the entire um, piece of land. So it's, it's multi-layered where it's trees across the site are then planted with sweet potatoes and other other smaller pieces of cover crops through to larger layered pieces. Um, that, as, as I understand at the moment, that's the general plan. And then we've got a, a, a permaculture plan that we've uh, been working on through the website that's now designed that will come out at some point later in terms of the plan for the various bits of the site, because it's quite hilly. It goes up from where number two is there, the top left bit. It's quite a, a steep hill to that point to a water tower on the top of the site. Um, we host a water tower on that, which gives us free water from the water company. So that's uh, quite useful for, for the project. Um, and then uh, up through the number three, there's a valley and then back up a, a, a high hill as well. So there's different areas that the food team, who are a number of permaculture designers in there, have been mapping out that we can share. So as, as I'm the in the legal team, the governance stuff, and my experience with the land trust, but there's people that can answer those questions a lot more adequately than me and would be happy to. Uh, the second bit around the obligations of the, the, um, the token holders. So to be a token holder, you've got to be a member. And to be a member, you've got to have uh, stayed on the project for at least two weeks. So it's, a, it's not easy to buy this token. And there's a number of qualifiers there intentionally to make sure that people are connected well to the project, are people that everyone would want to live with, or well, not necessarily everyone, but that, that, you know, that can integrate themselves within this project, can offer something and add something without wanting to take over themselves. That there's a number of protocols of being a member and there's a number of guidelines of being uh, to, to uphold to make sure that this is a place where people uh, want to live, can thrive, can engage. That'll be an ongoing process to keep designing that. 
So it's not aimed to keep people out. It's still meant to be inclusive, but it's meant to really prioritize the, the, the safety and well-being of people that are going to live there, that call their, that, um, this place their home. Um, and so that's the first step. Is, is, it's quite difficult. Um, they won't have to come every year at that point. There may be conversations that we're talking about that after a couple of years, if you haven't been as a token holder, there may be some questions and we may start talking about whether your membership is rescinded or what happens, but essentially you've already been um, downscaled through your governance if you haven't turned up to the site. But other than that, you don't have to turn up all the time. You don't have to contribute a certain amount of hours to be a token holder. Uh, you own the equity in this organization. You are, you're a financial stakeholder as well as that governance um, rights. Uh, and so there's, there's no real obligations beyond that at this stage. To be a visitor on the site, so you also get first priority to, live, to book bits of the, of, the, um, of the accommodation on site. So if you want to stay there and you get to the booking system, you get first priority above visitors and, and guests. And that also gives you the right to invite guests into, the, into TDF at this point. Um, but the visitors, they can do, um, they can, so the volunteers, they do, are expected to do two to three hours of work a day at the moment uh, on the project, which is quite light compared to other similar projects uh, around that area. Um, you pay 10 euros a day for food, but otherwise everything else is included in your volunteering time. So that's the obligation on a volunteer. But as you said, the guest uh, is a paying person. They don't, they don't have to do the volunteering, they live there. And at the moment, I, th I believe it's 40 euros to stay on, on the site, which all of this income generation is going towards the regeneration of the land. So the, the business model, which I forgot, um, is both the housing and, and the people wanting to live there, but also a commercial restaurant, um, co-working space, which is shared across the places. Um, there's gonna be a natural pool, and so there's gonna be a number of um, events that also happen on the land that we already have. So 100 to 150 people at a time. Uh, so there's a number of income generating activities on site that are already happening and will continue to be built into that support um, the regeneration of the land, uh, the land and planting more trees. Is that clearish that there's no real obligation to token holders day to day? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so like if you're on the land, like visiting as a token holder, there's no obligations yeah. still. So, so there's like volunteers like working, <laughs> there's guests like paying but not working and there's token holders doing what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a, it, it'll be in the white paper. And, um, it's not something I've looked at yet, um, actually. So it's not to hand. They won't just be able to sit around doing nothing while other people look after them, that's for sure. There's obligations on them, um, but I'm not sure what they are at this point. Yeah. No, I'm just adding, like, if you're working as a guest, then you can also get a discount. So that's pretty nice. <laughs> like, so, like, things are acknowledged that you contribute, even as a guest. Yeah. yeah. Finished. Yeah, yeah. So one more question or just go? Last question, yeah, okay. Yeah, I have a question about the private owner. So how does the transition happen from the person who privately owned the land, purchased it, um, to either the Swiss entity, which I assume is controlled by the token holders, so by proxy they have control. But yeah, can you talk about the transition and how that happens? Yeah. And if the financing that you're doing this year is sort of part of that to buy out the private owner? Or? Yeah, uh, so there's a Portuguese company called Enciada, um, and that currently runs all the business activities on the Portuguese site, the events and other things. So the income's going through that organization. Um, that organization will be owned by the Swiss Association. So their transfer is going on at the moment in return for tokens. So they'll be buying them, uh, that, this organization. And then we've got an agreement drafted for the purchase of this land from this private individual into the Portuguese company. And so that's the way it will happen, is making sure that everything's done in terms of the Swiss Association's relationship to this owning this Portuguese company, then the Portuguese company will buy it off this person. Yeah, thanks. And would you recommend that generally, to have a private individual purchase and then do financing? Or do you think it would have been simpler to do the crowdfund and then purchase the land with that? Um, yeah. In my experience, this can often be a speedier way to guaranteeing you, you can hold the land and then opens you up to being able to raise further finance elsewhere because you've got that strong position. Um, but if you've got the financing to, uh, to, to do it already, then that is a route. Um, but crowdfunding, in my experience, doesn't tend to raise um, significant amounts at this point before you've got a working prototype on the ground. And so there's being able to bring people there to, to be there, to live there, to, to 
engage with it and to be bought into it is an important factor, I'd say. Yeah. Nice. Thanks.